The Battle of Balan was fought in 1808 by the Spanish Army of Andalusia, led by generals Francisco Castaños and Theodor von Reding, and the Imperial French Army's Second Corps d'Observation de la Gironde under General Pierre Dupont de l'Etang. This battle was the first ever open field defeat of the Napoleonic Army. The heaviest fighting took place near Balan, sometimes anglicized Balan, a village by the Guadalquivir River in the Jaén province of southern Spain, in June 1808. Following the widespread uprisings against the French occupation of Spain, Napoleon organized French units into flying columns to pacify Spain's major centers of resistance. One of these, under General Dupont, was dispatched across the Sierra Morena and south through Andalusia to the port of Cadiz where a French naval squadron lay at the mercy of the Spanish. The Emperor was confident that with 20,000 men, Dupont would crush any opposition encountered on the way. Events proved otherwise, and after storming and plundering Córdoba in July, Dupont retraced his steps to the north of the province to await reinforcements. Meanwhile, General Castaños, commanding the Spanish Field Army at San Roque, and General von Reding, governor of Malaga, traveled to Seville to negotiate with the Seville Junta—a patriotic assembly committed to resisting the French incursions—and to turn the province's combined forces against the French. Dupont's failure to leave Andalusia proved disastrous. Between 16 and 19 July, Spanish forces converged on the French position stretched out along villages on the Guadalquivir and attacked at several points, forcing the confused French defenders to shift their divisions this way and that. With Castaños pinning Dupont downstream at Andujar, Reading successfully forced the river at Mengibar and seized Balin, interposing himself between the two wings of the French army. Caught between Castaños and Reading, Dupont attempted vainly to break through the Spanish line at Balin in three bloody and desperate charges, losing more than 2,500 men. His attacks defeated, Dupont called for an armistice and was compelled to sign the Convention of Andujar which stipulated the surrender of almost 18,000 men, making Balin the worst disaster and capitulation of the Peninsular War. In one of the most controversial episodes of the campaign, Dupont ordered his subordinate, Dominique Honoré Antoine Vidal, to surrender his division. Though Vedel's troops were outside the Spanish encirclement, with a good chance of escape, that general surrendered. When news of the catastrophe reached the French high command in Madrid, the result was a general retreat to the Ebro, abandoning much of Spain to the insurgents. France's enemies in Spain and throughout Europe cheered at this first check to the hitherto unbeatable imperial armies. Tales of Spanish heroism inspired Austria and showed the force of nationwide resistance to Napoleon, setting in motion the rise of the Fifth Coalition against France. Alarmed by these developments, Napoleon briefly took command of the Spanish theatre and, at the head of fresh troops and overwhelming numbers, dealt devastating blows to the vacillating Spanish rebels and their British allies, recapturing Madrid in November 1808. In doing so, however, the French military committed enormous resources to a long war of attrition characterized by heavy losses to the implacable Spanish guerrillas, ultimately leading to the expulsion of French armies from Spain and the exposure of southern France to invasion in 1814 by combined Spanish, British, and Portuguese forces. <laughs> Background between 1807 and 1808, thousands of French troops marched into Spain to support a Spanish invasion of Portugal orchestrated by Napoleon, who used the opportunity to initiate intrigues against the Spanish royal family. A coup d'état, instigated by Spanish aristocrats with French support, forced Charles IV from his throne in favour of his son Ferdinand, and in April, Napoleon removed both royals to Bayonne to secure their abdication and replace the Spanish Bourbon line with a Bonapartist dynasty headed by his brother Joseph Bonaparte. However, none of these politicians sat well with the Spanish masses, who declared their loyalty to the deposed Ferdinand and revolted at the prospect of a foreign ruler. An uprising by the citizens of Madrid broke out on May 2, slew 150 French soldiers, and was violently stamped out by Marshal Joachim Murat's elite Imperial Guards and Mamluk cavalry. Joseph's entry into his prospective kingdom was delayed as guerrillas poured down from the mountains and seized or threatened the main roads. On 26 May, Joseph Bonaparte, in absentia, was proclaimed King of Spain and the Indies in Madrid, his envoys receiving the acclamations of the Spanish notables. 
The Madrileños, however, were indignant. Spanish soldiers quietly withdrew to insurgent held villages and outposts outside the city, and only Marat's 20,000 bayonets kept the city in order. Outside the capital, the French strategic situation deteriorated rapidly. The bulk of the French army, 80,000 strong, could hold only a narrow strip of central Spain stretching from Pamplona and San Sebastián in the north through to Madrid and Toledo to the south. Marat, stricken in an outbreak of rheumatic colic which swept the French camp, quit his command and returned to France for treatment. The Spanish priests would have rejoiced if the hand of God had been laid on him, whom they called the Butcher of the 2nd of May, General Anne Jean Marie René Savary, a man more distinguished as Minister of Police than as any field commander, arrived to take command of the shaky French garrison at a critical hour. With much of Spain in open revolt, Napoleon established a headquarters at at Bayonne on the Spanish frontier to reorganize his beleaguered forces and redress the situation. Having little respect for his Spanish opponents, the Emperor decided that a swift display of force would cow the insurgents and quickly consolidate his control of Spain. To this end, Napoleon dispatched a number of flying columns to throttle the rebellion by seizing and pacifying Spain. S major cities from Madrid, Marshal Jean Baptiste Bessières pushed northwest into Old Castile with 25,000 men and sent a detachment east into Aragon, aiming to capture Santander with one hand and Zaragoza with the other. Marshal Bon Adrian Genot de Mancy marched toward Valencia with 29,350 men, and General Guillaume Philibert Duhesme marshaled 12,710 troops in Catalonia and put Girona under siege. Finally, General Pierre Dupont de L. A Tong, a distinguished division commander, was to lead 13,000 men south towards Seville and ultimately the port of Cadiz, which sheltered Admiral François Rossilli's fleet from the Royal Navy. Topic: <laughs> War reaches Andalusia. Topic: Dupont's corps primarily fielded of second-line forces of a distinctly unimpressive character. These second-line troops, originally raised as provisional or reserve formations, had been intended either for internal police services or garrison duty in Prussia—evidence that Napoleon intended the Spanish campaign to be a mere promenade. Quote, this force approached Córdoba in early June and in their first formal battle on Andalusian soil, captured the bridge at Alcalea, sweeping past the Spanish troops under Colonel Don Pedro de Echavarri that attempted to block their progress. The French entered Córdoba that same afternoon and ransacked the town for four days. However, in the face of increasingly menacing mass uprisings across Andalusia, Dupont decided to withdraw to the Sierra Morena, counting on help from Madrid. The French retreated fitfully in the sweltering heat, burdened with some 500 wagons of loot and 1,200 ill. A French surgeon remarked, "'Our little army carried enough baggage for 150,000 men. Mere captains required wagons drawn by four mules. We counted more than fifty wagons per battalion, the result of the plunder of Córdoba. All our movements were impeded. We owed our defeat to the greed of our generals." General Jacques Nicolas Gobert's division set out from Madrid on July 2 to add weight to Dupont's expedition. However, only one brigade of his division ultimately reached Dupont, the rest being needed to hold the road north against the guerrillas. Reinforcements across the Sierra Napoleon and the French strategists, anxious about their communications with Bayonne and wary of a British descent upon a Biscayan coast already in open revolt, initially prioritized operations in the north of Spain. In mid-June General Antoine Charles Louis Lasalle's victory at Cabazan simplified matters tremendously, with the Spanish militias around Valladolid destroyed and much of Old Castile overrun, Savary shifted his gaze south and resolved to reopen communications with Dupont in Andalusia. Apart from the menace in the north, Napoleon was most anxious to secure the Andalusian provinces, where the traditional, rural peasantry was expected to resist Joseph. S. Rule. On June 19 General Dominique Honoré Antoine Videl with Dupont's 2nd Infantry Division was dispatched south from Toledo to force a passage over the Sierra Morena, hold the mountains from the guerrillas, and link up with Dupont, pacifying Castile-La Mancha along the way. 
Videl set out with 6,000 men, 700 horse, and 12 guns, joined during the march by small detachments under generals Claude Royce and Louis Ligier Belair. The column raced across the plains, encountering no resistance, although stragglers were seized and cut down by the locals. Reaching the Sierra on June 26, the column found a detachment of Spanish regulars, smugglers, and guerrillas with six guns under Lieutenant Colonel Valdecanos blocking the Puerta del Rey. Videl S troops stormed the ridge and overran the enemy cannon, losing 17 dead or wounded. They then pushed south over the mountains toward La Carolina. The next day they encountered a detachment of DuPont's troops preparing to attack these same passes from the south side. With this junction, communications between DuPont and Madrid were re-established after a month of silence. Topic: <laughs> Confused orders. Topic. Videl carried new orders from Madrid and Bayonne. Dupont was instructed to stop his march on Cadiz and fall back north eastwards on the mountains, a fait accompli, watching the Spanish movements in Andalusia while awaiting the reinforcements to be released upon the capitulation of Zaragoza and Valencia. These capitulations never came. For a time, Marshal Monsi was simply nowhere to be found. At length, his defeat at the gates of Valencia surfaced. Some 17,000 Spaniards under the Conde de Cervellan massed victoriously around that city as Monsi gave up in disgust, having lost 1,000 men in a vain attempt to storm the walls. Suddenly, all prospects evaporated of Monsi's corps pivoting west from Valencia toward Granada and coupling with Dupont in a two pronged invasion of Andalusia. Nor were troops forthcoming from Aragon, as Zaragoza shook off repeated French assaults and vowed to fight to the death. Meanwhile, Savary set to work preparing for the arrival of Joseph in his new capital. Many of the scattered French formations were drawn back around Madrid for security. Dupont would remain close at hand to succor the capital if Bessieres. Campaign in the north took a turn for the worse, and Spanish armies appeared on the horizon. Yet at no time was Dupont's Andalusian expedition altogether scrapped. Savary continued to issue vague orders promising reinforcements at an undisclosed date while Napoleon fumed at the prospect of abandoning even Andujar to the Spaniards. With events hanging in the air, Dupont chose to hold his ground along the Guadalquivir, sacking and occupying the town of Balin and the provincial capital of Jaén, instead of completing his retrograde movement to the strong positions atop the Sierra's defiles. Napoleon wrote lightly, "...even if he suffers a setback less than pre greater than slash pre greater than dot 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 he will just have to come back over the Sierra." Spain prepares On learning of the French incursion into the southern provinces, General Francisco Javier Castaños, guessing Dupont's intentions, prepared to entrench his army in a fortified camp across from the strong point of Cadiz, but Dupont's retrograde movement rendered these precautions unnecessary. Setting up a general headquarters in Utrera, Castaños organized the Army of Andalusia into four divisions under Generals Theodor von Reading, Antonio Mallet whose staff included a young San Martín, then a captain in the Spanish Army, Felix Jones, and a fourth reserve under Manuel La Peña. Colonel Juan de la Cruz Mergen led an additional column of some 1,000 skirmishers, armed peasants, and other light infantry. Topic. Stalled on the Guadalquivir. While Dupont lingered at Andujar with two divisions Generals Gabriel Barbu de Corrières and Maurice Ignace Frisia, attempting to master the strategic Madrid—Seville Highway and the wide plains which it crossed, Castaños' four divisions advanced steadily from the south and guerrillas from Granada marched to bar the road to the Sierra and La Mancha beyond. Videl S Division was posted east to Balin with a view to guarding these nearby mountain passes and on July 1 Videl was forced to dispatch a brigade under General Louis Victorin Casson to curb the advance of the guerrillas on Jaén and La Carolina, stretching the French line still further east. Meanwhile, General Liger Belair with 1,500 men moved into a forward post at Mengibar, a village on the south bank of the Guadalquivir. 
At Anduhar a tower by the river was fortified and small field works constructed on the south bank to forestall an enemy crossing, but, the Guadalquivir being fordable at so many points, and open to fire from the surrounding hills, Dupont's defences did not inspire much confidence. Kassan, after driving the guerrillas off en route, returned to Balin on July 5 with 200 dead or wounded and nothing to show for his exertion. The Spaniards having plundered the towns of all provisions, glimmers of the long promised reinforcements appeared at last. Generals Gobert and Jacques Lefranc passed the Puerta del Rey July 15, leaving behind a strong garrison in the Morena, and descended into Andalusia with their remaining infantry and cuirassiers. Dupont now had over 20,000 men idling along the Guadalquivir while the Spaniards massed and approached. But supplies were scarce and the Spanish peasants had deserted their fields, obliging Dupont. S. wearied men to bring in the harvest, grind the grain, and bake their own rations. Six hundred men fell ill during their fortnight's stay by drinking the putrid waters of the Guadalquivir. According to French testimony, the situation was terrible. Every night, we heard armed peasants roaming around us, drawn to our goods, and every night, we expected to be assassinated. <laughs> Early fighting Topic. On July 9 General Lane Peña's division took up a position extending from El Carpio to Porcuna and the Army of Andalusia began a number of demonstrations against the French. From west to east along the Guadalquivir, Castaños with 14,000 men in two divisions La Peña and Jones approached Dupont at Andujar, Cupini advanced his division to Villa Nueva, and Reading prepared to force a passage at Mengibar and swing north to Balin, outflanking the French and cutting Dupont's line of retreat to the mountains. Marching east to Jaén, Reading delivered a strong attack against the French right wing between July 2 and July 3, sending the 3rd Swiss Regiment into the teeth of Cassan's brigade. The Spaniards were forced back, losing 1,500 casualties according to Maximilian Sebastian Foy, but the isolated French brigade felt its danger and on the 4th Cassan fell back over the Guadalquivir to Balin, leaving only a few companies to guard the ferry at Mengibar. Reading assaulted Mengibar anew on July 13 and drove Ligier Belair from the village after a hard fight, at the appearance of Videl. S Division, however, the Spanish column quietly drew back and French infantry reclaimed the town. The next day Cupini tested the grounds at Villa Nueva and engaged the French pickets opposite him in a sharp skirmish. Castaños reached the heights at Arjonilla on July 15 and, setting up a battery on a ridge overlooking Andujar, opened fire on Dupont. At the same time, 1,600 to 4,000 skirmishers and irregulars under Colonel Cruz Mergen forded the river near Marmoleo and attacked towards Dupont's rear, but were handily repulsed by a French battalion and dispersed into the hills. Alarmed by this show of force, Dupont called on Videl to release a battalion or even a brigade to his assistance, and Videl, judging that Mengibar was not seriously threatened, set out in the night with his entire division. The arrival of Videl with this sizable force put an end to the threat at Andujar but gravely imperiled the French left wing Mengibar Balin La Carolina, leaving Ligier Belair seriously denuded of troops in his fight against Reading. <laughs> Battle on July 16, Dupont and Videl, expecting a desperate struggle for Andujar, found Castaños and Cupini merely repeating the previous day's noisy demonstrations without seriously attempting a passage. Reading, however, was on the move, making a feint toward the Mengibar ferry with his sharpshooters. The Swiss forded the river upstream at Rincon and, encircling Mengibar, crushed the French battalions under Ligier Belair. General Gobert, rushing forth from Balin to plug the gap, was shot in the head and later died of the wound, and his counterattack, carried on by General of Brigade François Bertrand Dufour, collapsed under the weight of the Spaniards. Distracting Reading with repeated charges from his cuirassiers, Dufour disengaged his men and fell back onto Balin. Alerted to the loss of Mengibar, Dupont hesitated once again. Unwilling to take advantage of Videl's presence to engage in a trial of strength with Castaños, a successful attack on the Arjonilla might have turned the Spanish line in return and allowed Dupont to swing across the rear of Cupini and Reading. Dupont hunkered down at Andujar and ordered Videl 
S. Weary division back to Balin to prevent the collapse of the right wing. The right wings disengage the fighting around Mengibar then took a curious turn, reading, having finally gained the north bank and turned the French flank, suddenly retreated to the other side of the river, perhaps feeling isolated with his lone division. At the same time, guerrillas under Colonel Valdecanos made an unwelcome appearance on Dufour's flank, scattering his outposts and menacing the road to the Puerta del Rey. Dufour, conscious of the danger to the mountain passes, set off to confront the Spanish flankers at Garroman and La Carolina. Consequently, when Vidal, by another tiring night march, retraced his steps to Balin, he found the position oddly deserted of both friend and foe. When his reconnaissance parties made no contact with the enemy at the Guadalquivir, Vidal concluded that Reading had shifted his division to another point along the line. Dufour sent back alarming reports from Garroman, convincing Videl that 10,000 Spaniards—perhaps Reading's division, he warned—were marching on the mountains to their rear. This was too much. Gathering his exhausted division, Videl hurried to Dufour's aid on July 17, arriving at Santa Carolina the next day. Dufour's fatal blunder was soon revealed. Videl discovered that the small band of irregulars roaming about were not at all the threat Dufour had described. For the third time, the Spaniards had stolen a march from him, and Reading still hovered somewhere around Mengibar, out of sight. Worse yet, an enormous gap now existed between Dupont and Videl, and not a single battalion remained to prevent Reading from seizing the central position at Balin. Topic: <laughs> Trapped. Topic. News of Vidal's ill-advised movements reached Dupont at noon on July 18 and convinced him to fall back on Balin and to recall Vidal there as well, reconcentrating his now dangerously scattered army, I do not care to occupy Andujar. That post is of no consequence, with a wary eye on Castaños. Columns across the river, and needing time to prepare his wagons and carriages encumbered by plunder from the sack of Cordoba, Dupont postponed the retreat till nightfall, hoping to conceal his departure from the Spaniards. Meanwhile, Reading, calling up Cupini's division from Villa Nueva, had crossed at Mengibar on July 17 and seized the deserted Balin, bivouacking there the night and preparing to swing west towards Dupont's and what he assumed to be Videl. S oblivious as he was to the latter's recent movement east—position in the morning. Videl quit La Carolina at 5 a.m. July 18 and rushed the bone-weary French right wing southwest toward Balin, unwittingly bearing down on Reading's rear. Both armies were now north of the Guadalquivir and staggered in a curious position, Dupont between Castaños and Reading, Reading between Dupont and Videl. At Garroman, scarcely two leagues from Balin, Videl rested his footsore troops for a few hours. He could not refuse this, says General Foy, after three days and three nights of incessant marching, while patrols raced west to Linners to secure his rear. Aware neither that Dupont was preparing to move in his direction, nor that Videl was now in fact drawing in behind him, reading, posting a few battalions to hold Balin from whatever French formations might remain in the east, set off with his two divisions westwards July 18, intending to surround Andujar from the rear and smash Dupont against Castaños. Dupont slipped away from Andujar unobserved and at dawn July 19, his vanguard under Brigadier Theodore Chabert made contact with reading. S leading elements veterans of the Walloon Guard just shy of Balin. Though caught off guard, Reading reacted with promptitude and skill, dissolving his columns and drawing up a defensive line with twenty guns in an olive grove intersected with deep ravines, about two miles from Dupont's main body. Badly underestimating the force before him, Chabert charged his 3,000 men into Reading's two divisions and was enfiladed and repulsed with heavy losses. Dupont, following with the main body of the convoy at two leagues' distance, halted the bloodied vanguard, posted General Barbu to defend the rear against any pursuit by Castaños, and ordered all other formations to the fore in an attempt to crack Reading's line, expecting to be overtaken and crushed by Castaños' columns at any moment. One division under La Peña had already crossed to Andujar in pursuit and approached steadily. Dupont committed his troops piecemeal, without massing a reserve. 
As one historian observes, his troops were both exhausted and strung out, and to commit them to battle in dribs and drabs was foolhardy in the extreme. Brigadiers Chabert and Claude Francois Dupre led an infantry brigade and the horse chasseur against the left wing, held by the Walloon guards, but no ground was gained and Dupre fell mortally wounded at the head of his troops. Dupont's scattered guns were laboriously formed into batteries to support the attack, only to be knocked out by the heavier Spanish artillery once the firing began. On the right, opposite Reading's militias and Swiss regulars, a fierce and desperate attack bent back the Spanish line. The cuirassiers trampled a Spanish infantry regiment, reached the artillery and sabred the gunners, but the defenders, extending their line and maintaining a constant fire, compelled the French to abandon the captured guns and fall back. Fresh troops came up at 10 a.m. and Dupont immediately launched a third attack, with General Claude Marie Joseph Panetier's brigade leading the charge. One last formation joined them, d. Augier's Marines of the Imperial Guard, in theory the best troops present, they were only 300 men, Foy remarks, but they were 300 whom no fears could ever make falter. Dupont, himself wounded in the hip, grouped his exhausted and worn out regiments around the Guard Battalion in a last effort to break through to Balin. At this point, reserves may have pierced the badly shaken Spanish line, Dupont had none, and the French columns, mercilessly raked by the Spanish artillery, were forced back down the slope for the third time. Dupont's Swiss regiments, originally in Spanish service, defected, arms and baggage, to their former masters, and lastly, Castaños. Force finally arrived, overtaking Barbu along the Rumbler, a small tributary flowing from the Morena into the Guadalquivir, with La Peña's division sounding its guns and preparing to storm the French rearguard. The day was lost. Topic: <laughs> <laughs> Closing moves. Topic. An unexpected Spanish reinforcement appeared suddenly in the last minutes of the battle, slipping south out of the foothills along the Rumbler and taking up positions among the rocks on the French left flank, Colonel de la Cruz. Driven off into the mountains in the attack of July 16, de la Cruz had regrouped 2,000 sharpshooters at Peñas del Moral and climbed back down towards the battle, directed by the sound of firing. Dupont was now hopelessly surrounded on three sides. Towards noon, as Dupont S guns went quiet. Videl continued from Garroman onto Balin and observed napping troops, which he assumed to be Dupont. S vanguard returning from Andujar. In fact, they were reading. S Spaniards. Videl and Reading prepared for battle. The former pulling up Lagrange. S cuirassiers, Casan. S legion and Dufour. S brigade for the attack. On the Spanish side, Reading deployed Cupini. S division to meet the threat, with an Irish battalion and two guns on a knoll leading up to the mountains, a regiment of regular troops, the Ordenes Militares, at the San Cristobal Monastery, militia in support, and the other battalions drawn up behind, in the centre. Two Spanish officers approached Videl under a flag of truce, announcing that Dupont had been badly defeated and had proposed to suspend arms. The Frenchman replied, Tell your general, that I care nothing about that, and that I am going to attack him. Videl directed Cassan's legion, supported by Andre Joseph Bussert's dragoons, against the Irish position on the knoll. While Kassan grappled the Irish, Boussard raced around the enemy flank and rear, trampled part of Cassigny's militia regiment, and enveloped the knoll. Their guns lost, the Irish battalion surrendered, and Videl's men took the knoll and 1,500 prisoners. Meanwhile, Colonel Roche's column struck the Spanish strongpoint at San Cristobal, possession of which was necessary if Videl hoped to turn Cupini and force open a path to Dupont. But here the Spanish regulars under Colonel Francisco Soler held their line obstinately and all attacks failed. Capitulation Upon Castaños' arrival Dupont decided to call for a truce, negotiating terms with the Spanish officers over several days. After learning this, Videl withdrew some distance along the highway. Spanish commanders threatened to massacre the French soldiers if this formation did not surrender, and Dupont compelled Videl to return and lay down his arms. 
Handing his sword to Castaños, Dupont exclaimed, You may well, General, be proud of this day, it is remarkable because I have never lost a pitched battle until now. I who have been in more than twenty, the Spaniard's biting reply. It is the more remarkable because I was never in one before in my life. Aftermath Repercussions <inaudible> 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 While neither a strategic set piece nor the war's largest or bloodiest battle, Balin quickly assumed mythical status in Spain, its symbolism far eclipsing reality the negotiated surrender of a rather inexperienced French corps in a peripheral theatre of war. News of the victory rallied much of the vacillating Spanish elite to the insurrectionary movement surging across the country. Suddenly, the expulsion of the French by arms seemed possible, if not inevitable. At the same time, Spanish victory in an obscure Andalusian village signaled to the armies of Europe that the French, long considered invincible, could be beaten—a fact that persuaded the Austrian Empire to initiate the War of the Fifth Coalition against Napoleon. This was an historic occasion, news of it spread like wildfire throughout Spain and then all Europe. It was the first time since 1801 that a sizable French force had laid down its arms, and the legend of French invincibility underwent a severe shaking. Everywhere anti-French elements drew fresh inspiration from the tidings. The Pope published an open denunciation of Napoleon, Prussian patriots were heartened, and, most significantly of all, the Austrian War Party began to secure the support of the Emperor Francis for a renewed challenge to the French Empire. To commemorate a victory so rich in symbolic and propaganda value, the Seville Junta instituted the Medalla de Balen. The British press avidly publicized the event and printed Castaño's victory statements across Europe. This army, so superior to ours, has not only been beaten and routed, but has been constrained to lay down its arms, and give up its artillery, and has suffered the lowest military degradation, which the French have been hitherto accustomed to impose upon all the other nations of Europe, and the imperial eagles, the proud insignia of their triumph, have become the trophies of the Spanish army of Andalusia on the fields of Balen. The defeat mortified Napoleon. The Emperor treated Dupont's capitulation as a personal affront and a blight on the imperial honour, pursuing a ruthless vendetta against all those involved. Dupont and Videl returned to Paris in disgrace and were duly court martialed, deprived of rank and title, and imprisoned at Fort de Joux for their role in the disaster. Dupont was not paroled until the restoration of Louis XVIII. Indeed, rumours persisted that he had been quietly assassinated in captivity. None of the commanding officers, however slight their share of the responsibility, escaped without retribution. Napoleon held that his army in Spain had been commanded by postal inspectors rather than generals. In January 1809, the Emperor halted a parade in Valladolid when he recognized Dupont's chief of staff among the commanders, scolding the unfortunate officer in full view of the troops and ordering him off the square. According to General Foy, Napoleon began his tirade, "'What, General? Did not your hand wither up when you signed that infamous capitulation?' Years later, Napoleon opened an inquiry into the Convention of Andujar under the mandate of the Imperial High Court, in Camera, which turned out yet another proclamation against Dupont. An imperial decree dated May 1, 1812, prohibited any field commander to treat for capitulation and declared every unauthorized surrender a criminal act punishable by death. <inaudible> <inaudible> French flight and recovery Apart from the blow to French prestige, Balin threw the French invasion forces—faltering after their failure to secure Girona, Zaragoza, Valencia, Barcelona, and Santander, and with the country rapidly arming and mobilizing against them—into panic and disarray. With the sudden loss of 20,000 troops, Napoleon's military machine abruptly fell apart. On Savary S. advice, Joseph fled from the openly hostile capital, joining him on the highway were Bessieres and Monsi, who drew the French corps north from Madrid and continued past Burgos in what became a wholesale retreat. The French did not halt until they were safely over the Ebro, where they could set up secure defensive positions along the north bank and wait out events. From his makeshift headquarters at Vitoria, Joseph wrote to his brother gloomily, "'I repeat that we have not a single Spanish supporter. The whole nation is exasperated and determined to fight." Napoleon, furious and dismayed, remarked that to cross the Ebro was 
tantamount to evacuating Spain. In November, Napoleon directed the bulk of the Grande Armée across the Pyrenees and dealt a series of devastating blows to the vacillating Spanish forces, receiving the surrender of Madrid in scarcely a month's time. Fate was particularly cruel to the victors of Balen. Castaños was himself routed by martial lands at the Battle of Tadella in November 1808, while Reading was ridden down and trampled by the French cavalry at the Battle of Vols in 1809, dying of his wounds. Marshal Soult overran much of Andalusia the following year and on January 21, 1810, his men recovered the lost eagles from the Cathedral of Balen. Before long, only Cadiz remained firmly in Spanish hands, and a difficult war lay ahead to drive the invader from Spain. Fate of the prisoners Dupont and his staff officers were transported on Royal Navy vessels to Rochefort Harbour after the Seville Junta refused to honour the pact under which the French were to be repatriated via Cadiz. The French prisoners were kept in Cadiz Harbour aboard prison hulks, old warships that had their masts and rigging removed. They were fed at irregular intervals on the overcrowded vessels. The start of the siege of Cadiz in 1810 meant that French troops occupied the land approaches to the city. From 6 to 9 March 1810 a howling storm struck from the southwest and drove one Portuguese and three Spanish battleships ashore, where they were destroyed by French cannon fire. Thirty merchant ships were also sunk or driven ashore in the same tempest, including one vessel with 300 men of the British Fourth Foot who became prisoners of war. The French officers, who were segregated aboard the Castilla, noted that vessels which had lost their anchors had drifted onto the opposite shore during the storm. During the next southwester, on the night of 15 and 16 March, the officers overcame their Spanish guards and cut the prison hulk's cables. The French fought off the crews of two gunboats that tried to retake the vessel and over 600 escaped when the Castilla grounded on the French side of the bay. Ten days afterward, the prisoners on the Argonauta tried the same thing, but suffered a worse fate. The ship stuck fast on a bar out in the harbour and was taken under fire by several gunboats. At length the ship caught fire and fewer than half of the prisoners survived to be rescued by their compatriots. Several British sailors later expressed their revulsion at having to shoot at escaping prisoners. The few remaining officers were transferred first to Majorca and later to England. The rank and file were sent to the Canary and Balearic Islands, where the inhabitants protested at the proximity of so many of their enemies. Consequently, 7,000 prisoners were put on the uninhabited island of Cabrera. The Spanish government, which could barely supply its own armies in the field, was unable to properly take care of the prisoners. Cannibalism was alleged to have occurred during times when the supply ships failed to arrive. On 6 July 1814, the remaining survivors of Balen returned to France, fewer than half remained, most having perished in captivity. Many of the survivors never recovered their health after the experience. Analysis. <laughs> <laughs> Balen was a triumph for the Spanish Bourbon regime's regular army, successor to the glorious Tercios, which Napoleon had derided as the worst in Europe while dismissing the Spanish militia as packs of bandits led by monks. Castaños conceded that the greater part of his troops had been raw and inexperienced, but they were Spaniards, and Spaniards are heroes, and indeed this maligned army, largely untouched by French revolutionary innovations, a relic of 18th century absolutism outfought the imperial citizen soldiers. Spawn's ancient regime military, however, was soon eclipsed by the growing scale of the war crippled by the infusion of untrained conscripts and caught up in the competing designs of the juntas. Subsequent attempts to replicate Balen proved particularly dangerous for Spanish units recruited and equipped in the chaos of French military occupation and counterinsurgency. The raw levies that formed the bulk of the Spanish forces proved incapable of maneuvering in the face of the enemy, whilst many of them barely knew how to use their weapons, having sometimes only been issued with muskets the day before they went into action. These untrained recruits typically broke ranks when assaulted by the French regulars, accusing their commanders of treason and leaving the few Spanish regulars involved to fend for themselves as best they could. 
Having run away, meanwhile, the levies invariably exposed themselves to the French cavalry, which were unleashed amongst them with terrible effect, sabring them unmercifully and taking hundreds of them prisoner. Wellington, as Allied commander, would inherit this Balin syndrome and attempt to restrain the ardor of the Spanish under his command. So brilliant was the victory and so simple the encircling maneuver, that Wellesley later on had great difficulty in getting Balin out of the Spaniards' system. He used to say jocularly before every engagement, now this is not Balin, don't attempt to make it a Battle of Balin. Topic Battle of Balin in literature topic F. L. Lucas's novel The English Agent, A Tale of the Peninsular War 1969, the account of a British Army officer gathering information before the first British landings, is about the Battle of Balin and its aftermath. Topic notes topic topic References topic Cahuela Fernandez, José Gregorio 2008. La Guerra de la Independencia, Historia Bélica, Pueblo y Nación en España, 1808–1814. Universidad de Salamanca. ISBN 978-84-7800-334-1. Chandler, David G. The Campaigns of Napoleon. Weidenfeld and Nicholson. ISBN 0-297-81367-6. Foy, Maximilian Sebastian 1827. History of the War in the Peninsula under Napoleon. 2. S. and R. Bentley. Estale, Charles J. 2003. The Peninsular War, A New History. Macmillan. ISBN 978-1-4039-6231-7. Gates, David the Spanish Ulcer, A History of the Peninsular War. W. W. Norton & Co. ISBN 0-393-02281-1. Glover, Michael The Peninsular War 1807–1814, A Concise Military History. Penguin Classic Military History published 2001. ISBN 0-14-139041-7. Hamilton, Thomas Annals of the Peninsular Campaigns, from MDCCCVIII to MDCCCXIV. W. Blackwood. Larchie, Loraden. Les Suites d'une Capitulation, Relations des Captifs de Balin et de la Glorieuse Retraite du 116e Regiment. Imp. Th. Lombards. Longford, Elizabeth. Wellington, The Years of the Sword. Panther. ISBN 978-0-586-03548-1. Lorblanches, Jean-Claude Les Soldats de Napoléon en Espagne et au Portugal, 1807–1814. Editions Larmatin. ISBN 978-2-296-02477-9. Napier, William History of the War in the Peninsula. I. Frederick Warren & Co. Oman, Charles A History of the Peninsular War Vol. 3. Mechanicsburg, Pennsylvania, Stackpole. ISBN 1-85367-223-8. Conde de Terrena Historia del Levantamiento, Guerra y Revolución de España. I. M. Rivadonera published 1872. Topic further reading topic Bueno, José María Uniformes Españoles de la Guerra de Independencia Aldaba, 1989, ISBN 84-86629-20-9. Estale, Charles J. The Spanish Army in the Peninsular War Manchester University Press, 1988, ISBN 0-7190-2538-9. Oman, Sir Charles A. History of the Peninsular War, 1807–09, From the Treaty of Fontainebleau to the Battle of Corona Greenhill Books, 1995, ISBN 1-85367-214-9, Partridge, Richard Battle Studies in the Peninsula May 1808 to January 1809 Constable and Robinson, 1998, ISBN 0-09-477620-2. External links Topic. Maps and information about the Battle of Balin The Cruel War in Spain – Armies, Battles, Skirmishes Battle of Balin. Spanish source Bicentenario de la Batalla de Balin